Hello and welcome back to another on location recording of the garden log with me Ben Dark. I'm in a very risky location for one of these broadcasts at the moment just skirting the edge of the ornamental lake back in Bernstorf Slotshewa and there are some very naughty collie dogs. They're very keen to get into that water and muddle about after some ducks. Today there is no mower all seems still and quiet as I walk up between this row of narrow spindle type apple trees towards an ornamental glass house. They've left the vine house open today. They've got the outer door open for some ventilation. They've got a mesh stopping me getting in there amongst the vines. This is one of those lean-to type greenhouses that you find at the edge of walled gardens and I'm just peering now into a fantastic tunnel of yellowing autumn vines. There's quite a few mouldering mummified grapes hanging on the boughs. They really should open it up. I could go in there and, and eat those grapes, and harvest them for them. The whole thing has the smell of a, a sitting room in which a sloppy sherry drinker has been gesticulating with his glass in the evenings for many decades. It's got a slightly whiny acrid tang, which I quite like. And there are little wasps still buzzing around, trying to feed themselves on that, on that grape juice. These are adult wasps looking for their own sustenance. I imagine that their little grubs have probably grown up by now and the grubs are what eat the meat. So when you see wasps attacking little caterpillars in the garden, they're, they're going to be food for the grubs. And these adult wasps, like the one I'm watching now, getting stuck into a browning grape, live on dew and, not on dew, honeydew and nectar and other sweet substances. I've been watching them recently. So there's a squawking from a magpie over there. You might get that on the, on the recording. I've been watching them on a very sunny, ivy-coloured wall in my garden at the moment and seeing their, their little battles with all the bees and all the hoverflies over the, the sweet ivy dew. We always hear that one should leave flowering ivy for the pollinators. And somehow it doesn't seem logical that that's, that's right. They seem such a dry and arid plant of the smoky city. But if you go and look at a hedge in the sunshine, you see that it is an absolute magnet for flying pollinators. The little dome on an ivy flower looks very sterile and closed, but when it gets into its male phase, you'll see it sprouts five little yellow anthers. And then once they've gone away, it enters a more of a female stage when, when the stigma becomes receptive. And at that stage, the whole dome of that flower sweats a nectary exudate, which is heaven to those little creatures. So it really is worth keeping some ivy in the garden. An ivy flower looks nice anyway. It brings some gothic charm to gardens that could otherwise be boring. Oh, look, here we go. Now I found three beehives between two giant great big magnolia trees. They're very active still. They're positioned to catch the southerly sun. And particularly the one on the left has all sorts of comings and goings. It's quite wonderful. This, this is a public park and there's no attempt to rope them off, keep me away from them. If I wanted to, I, I could go up there and get myself in a lot of trouble with those bees. But I won't, I'm going to leave them to it and head over into an area that contains some quite excitingly pruned fruit trees. There's a quince to my right, the ends of its water shoots are just succumbing to a little mildewy phase. But here in, in the garden is the least autumnal place for miles around in terms of leaves because apples and, and quinces and pears are so late to turn colour. 
sometimes in December in the UK, I don't know what about here. So while all the beaches and the oaks and, and even the big plane tree over there, which, which tend to go quite late as well, are rosseting up, here we are still green, if somewhat dark and tacky. Ah, here's the tree. Here's the tree I wanted to tell you about. It's a magnificent five-armed pyramid shape. It's almost a, a purely ornamental form. What's happened is there is a stake, probably three, three and a half meters high, that has been rammed, that has been rammed into the ground like a flagpole. And a vigorous apple has been planted next to it. I don't know what rootstock it's on. I'm just going down to the ground now. So it's a grafted onto a, a rootstock. Then you've got a trunk that is probably a foot and a half tall. And then the leader has been cut out and the plant has been allowed to branch into five arms. They've been tied down pretty rigorously and been allowed to grow out for about three foot in a straight line. And then when they reach three foot, they've been bent back sharply to the top of the pole. So that the whole thing resembles the, the point of uh, a spear or an arrow that is just emerging from the ground. It's very effective and it's been beautifully maintained. It must take quite a lot of summer pruning to manage something like this. I say it's vigorous because on these bottom arms, I can see how much growth has been put on them in a single year. These aren't four years of effort to get out to this level. It's, it's almost been done in one go. And yet it's in a very tightly constrained form. So there must be a huge amount of summer pruning each year to keep it in this position. Actual labor intensive and, and nicely done gardening. Summer pruning is one of those strange arts where it is damaging, it is damaging to the subject because of course you're removing vital leaf and stem and plants being inherently intelligent, intelligent on a, a sort of base thrumming green sort of level, don't do leaves and stems for fun or our benefit. They tend to look after themselves and by taking them out you take a bit of vigour away naturally from the tree which it has to try and get back and you also massively disrupt its hormonal balance. Plants are, are teenage in their levels of coursing, pumping hormones. It's incredible the messages and the, the, the chemicals they're sending around their little, little planty selves. And one of the, the prime locations for, for hormone production is in the buds, particularly the apical buds the buds at the tip, when they're taken off, it loses all sorts of auxins and creates profound changes throughout the body of the plant. I think that there's probably a parallel with human castration. You know how the, the famous castratos, the, the, great, the great singers in the opera of, of Italy, had a certain youthfulness about them, them forever, not just in the unbroken voice, but in their physiognomies. I know they were massive, but they had a sort of pre-adolescent distribution of fat and, and body shapes. And I think removing the auxins sort of wards off senescence in a similar way for these plants. They say that, that summer pruning done wrong can actually provoke the, the delay of dormancy to such a level that they end up getting zapped by frost, whacked out completely. It's a very, very interesting business. There's another whitewashed wall over here. This looks like the sunny side of a stove house. There's two big chimneys coming up from this whitewashed building, which I assume provided heat to this whole growing operation once. I found a little window I can peer through. 
That's very exciting. Let's go up close. You might hear a bit of an echo as I press my face to the glass here. There's potting benches and some wood store. You hear that little that little peeping horn? That's some gardeners going off in a little electric John Deere gator. I think they're taking trestle tables out of another greenhouse. They must have had the most magnificent wedding here at the weekend. Maybe while they're gone, I can go in to the greenhouse they've left open. Let's get there quickly. We'll go back to the stove in a moment. Well, their back is turned. They're just turning away at the top of the hill there. I assume they've got to unload and get things out of the way. So we'll try and get into this thing. The potted agapanthus, they've been moving around obviously. They've got one of those great big tree shifting things, like a big pair of earwig pincers attached to a giant handle. Okay, here's their open greenhouse. And yes, they're shifting out tables. There's vines covering the southerly sunny side, shading vast fuchsias in pots, big tree fuchsias with bonsai style trunks and also semi bonsai fig trees, which are quite nice to see. Gosh, this is a great vine here, an ornamental with vast dark red leaves. Let's see what vines they're growing. There's a vine growing in a pot here. A cellar. Don't know that one. Little fig trees over there. The big fig eaters here. Our neighbour passed a handful of ripe figs over the fence. This is Dessert King. And that's Dauphin Violet. Passed a handful of figs to us over the fence a month or so ago, which I think is probably the ultimate neighbourly gesture. And they were delicious. Oh, there's the white Marseille fig. I was trying to get White Marseille several years in London because it's the one that grows at Lambeth Palace. If anyone's been into the gardens at Lambeth Palace, there's a most magnificent old white Marseille fig, and I, I mean hundreds and hundreds of years old. And it behaves like some giant sea creature collapsing and rising from the waves in loops and tentacles of its body. And it's almost, it's almost like, like a growth rather than a single tree now, but it's still all connected. It's just rooted where it's left its elbows on the ground and then bits have died out and left those as almost separate trees. And I was trying to find a white Marseille because when I worked at the garden museum, the head gardener there would occasionally turn up with a platter of these perfect Lambeth Palace figs for us to have. And they're delicious. And I was going on the Fig Growers UK forum and I, I couldn't find them anywhere. And there it is, growing bonsai in a little pot in, in Denmark. I won't take a cutting because that would be terribly, terribly unfair, but maybe I can make friends with some gardeners here and see where they, they get their figs from. It's pretty old. The person who bought it might have, might have died by now. Anyway, you probably hear I'm out of that greenhouse now and I'm back at the potting house where these figs, sorry, I've got figs on the brain, where peaches have been grown espaliered against the wall. Quite well grown. There's a bit of peach leaf curl from the fungus has affected leaves growing earlier in the spring, but they've kept, kept them dry enough to keep most of it off. I can't see any evidence that they fruited or even flowered. So maybe it's, maybe it's ambition that should be celebrated more than outcome. Let's wait for that plane to go. Adieu. Gone now. Ambition rather than outcome. There's a huge, great, big space left for them to grow into. Firskin spalier. There we go. Firskin spalier. Firskin must be peach. We've got Avalon pride. Avalon pride. Frost, frost, riga, riga, and benedict. There's the varieties of peaches growing there. None that I have grown myself, for I have never grown a peach. That's the nice thing about being a gardener. There are a wealth 
of unfulfilled ambitions and you will never get to the end of them, never grow everything you need to. Oh, there are the gardeners back on their tractor. Luckily I've escaped them. I'm going to go back to the front of the hothouse now. And a Boston ivy, they've just cut back a Boston ivy that would have been growing all over these walls. Which I think is a bit of a shame because I like, I like Boston ivy at this stage of the year because it has the most wonderful petioles has the most wonderful bits, stems that attach the leaves to the trunk that are, are pink toned, fading to white. They look like a stick of rhubarb. And once the leaves have gone, they hold up in a way that Virginia creeper don't so much. And it's really nice to see. There's a great sedum roof on that hothouse I was talking about. Looking pink and in flower. I wonder if it's pink because it's flowering or if it's just a stressed plant. You quite often get a lot of, lot of pink in plants that are suffering slightly from drought or hard weather. They tend to produce a lot of anthocyanin, which I think helps them to grow in harder conditions. It soaks up free radicals, helps them to get on a little bit better. I can't really see what it is they're growing there. It's very good. Once that man stops scraping, I'll have to try and see if I can find a ladder and climb up. I'm sure they wouldn't mind a fellow gardener borrowing their ladder to see their, their roof. Anyway, I've come up and I'm now in an ornamental tea house with a great big crow raven on the roof. I really need to get my continental birds up to scratch. This is a bird you'll recognize and you'll laugh at me for not knowing from all of your trips to the continent. It's the corvid with a lovely gray body, black head, black tails and wings. And the black on its chest, I'm just looking at it now, it almost spreads out from its neck into one of those shapes like, like, the, like the griffin on a, on a Germanic crest or flag very, very attractive. Anyway, he's feeling very confident and cocksure on himself because he is up on the ridge line of this ornamental thatch cottage, which looks like the kind of place where residents of the big house, when this was still an occupied palace, would have come to set up for the afternoon and be served a tea. There are very, very low clipped hedges surrounding roses rose standards that have been trained around those umbrellas of steel. So what you've got is you've got a long straight scion that is probably one four foot tall and at the top of that long straight stem then grafted a weeping prostate form the rose that then cascades down around the side and is allowed to grow wiggly and wild all over the place. This is a very nice time to see them. They haven't been pruned yet. And so they are looking more unique and different from each other than they will at any other time of the year. This is the kind of place, I, I always found it with the, the standard Rabinias in the Italian garden at Chiswick House when I worked there. And just after clipping, they look identical. And then you get a year of eccentricity growing into them, a year of them moving away from each other in their looks, appearance and characters until, until they resemble their own, own beings at the end of the season. And then they're clipped back in again. Some of these roses are still in flower. It's quite a large flowered double, no scent there. And then the bases of the roses most of it seems to have been given over to bedding recently, recently cleared out. So this soil is pockmarked with the root balls of where the bedding sat. Wherever the bedding was, I don't think it did that well or wasn't in that long because these holes are very perfect and circular. So it didn't get its roots down particularly. I'm just going to go to the soil and do some detective work. See if we can work out what it was from the leaves that are left behind. 
it's it's one of those things of course it is it's one of those things that you know but you've forgotten the name of it's her purpley dark plant with a with a scratchy almost almost salvia like leaf it's going to come back to me as soon as i stop this section and i'll um, i'll probably edit it in i'll edit it in one of those robotic obviously recorded in a studio voices that you occasionally get and you'll hear me saying of course it's a so there we go i did remember after all unless i didn't edit that bit in anyway there's a uh, there's an also a sort of a rhodium style geranium down here very very low which is very nice purple flowered little thing very attractive hi There we go. No, it's all, all looking very lovely. People are back doing some more raking out, keeping things clean. And then on the other side of the garden, there's a great big bank of lavender. Lovely stuff. It's been cut back well, so it's now in its late October flush. There are still some old spent flower heads above and then little young ones below still rising up perfect and purple they're very small these second flowering flower heads so they're almost almost circles of flower rather than the big long cylinders that you associate with lavender in its first flush and then beyond them we've got pots of wonderful crammed in potted agapanthus which just looks super I know that agapanthus doesn't have to be jammed in and root bound to flower. That's a, a bit of a canard, but it does look good. It looks good when it's crammed in and there's a complete exuberant overflowing above the terracotta pot. It doesn't seem to damage them particularly. So I would encourage them to keep at it, not split them up too early. I wonder if they flowered. We could do a little poke around in the leaves. Oh yeah, look, there we go. There's lots of dried flowered stems. They're very happy there. Lots of snails as well. Snails living in there. They're lovely things. Now I'm just walking along a little rose arbor, which is very, very attractive. Roses trained over tensioned wire to cascade and flop around. It's very effective. They're incredibly formal in its structure, this wire. It looks like something that you would find in some industrial chic sort of area, but the roses soften it all magnificently. I'm gonna head out now to the other side of the little ornamental cottage. And then more agapanthus looking lovely in the pots here. And then, oh look, that's very sweet. I'm just passing the public toilet. It looks like they've got fresh cut flowers in the window. I'm gonna go and have a look in here and see. They do. They're very, very, very civilized. You can probably hear the change of atmosphere. This might be the first podcast you've ever listened to recorded inside a public toilet. They've got a nice vase of fresh cut dianthus, fresh cut pinks, all ruffled and salmony orange in there. And it's very pleasant. And that's how you probably should treat your public loo. Very nice. Right, back outside now. Public toilet podcast over for another week. I'm just gonna go through a gap in this lovely pruned hedge because I can see the tops of numerous apple trees. Here we go. Here's a proper orchard. Wow, there's a map here. This is very civilized. There's a map telling us all of the, the abels, the apples that they're growing here. Most of them local varieties, which is something you'd expect. So I don't really recognize any of these. They're able. Cox Orange, we know that one. The rest of them all completely new to me. 
Maybe we can go and see if there's any left on the tree or on the ground. Let's see if we can taste one, then bring it back and cross-reference it against the chart. Probably leaving it a little bit late here. And that's a little withered apple that was given up on earlier in the year there. We're not going to get anything good from that. What's this over here? This seems to have a little bit of abundance clinging to it. Something very dark, red and small. Let's have a little look at that. Take one of these off. Right, bear with me a moment. I'm just going to go back and see if I can triangulate what I'm eating here. So that second row in, fourth tree from the end. Second row in, fourth tree from the end. I think we'll probably hear a little bit of the garden log theme while I head back to the chart and see what this is. Right, welcome back to the Apple Tasting Podcast. I believe what I'm eating, and apologies for my terrible butchering of the Danish language, is an apple called Col de Mosgard. And that might be Col de Mosgard, because here it seems to have three A's in a row. K-O-L-D-E-M-O-S-E-G-A-A-A-R-D. Anyway, whatever it is, it's very tasty. It is as crisp and autumnal as the day itself. I would take a bite, but I don't think we want to hear both public toilets and up close chewing in one podcast. We'll save that for, for some other week. Anyway, it's juicy and firm, and it's one of those apples where you know when you've hit the skin. The skin is a separate element of the apple. It's not just a little bit of softness to contain the sugar. It has a, a hardness to it of its own, which is, is almost like a, a bit of, of waxed paper as opposed to, to tissue paper. It's got a feeling in the mouth, which I really like. I want to know my different bits of an apple. And I'm heading over now to the edge of this orchard. We're all bounded by a very lovely, crisp, clean hedge. There's a great big oak tree laying its leaves out across us. It's quite good. It's on the edge of the wild woods beyond. And it obviously grew there as a, as a little young tree, a lucky little seedling. I can't believe it's good fortune to have this soft little orchard full of eight foot tall apple trees to compete with, as opposed to the great big beaches beyond. And it's put all of its growth out onto the orchard side and is leaning, leaning over like a, like a teacher over the desk of a, of a child who is known for submitting poor quality work. Just looking at the ground here, I can see little mushrooms sprouting everywhere. I wondered if they were the magic mushrooms, but they're not. They don't have that little nipple on the top, but they're still that thin, slender stalked variety with a, the wiggly, wiggly stem, which are very exciting to see. Back into the orchard now. Looking at the beaches, I went down to see the most amazing beaches yesterday on Mons Klint, which is the white cliffs on the island of Mons down at the, the bottom of, of the island of Zealand, on which Denmark sits. And there are beech woods glowing right to the edge of these tall, tall chalk cliffs. Imagine the cliffs of Dover, but with a wood from the North Hampshire hangars slapped on top and slowly getting eaten up by the sea. I put a picture out on the Instagram feed of this, this great big autumn clad beach leaning out over this turquoise sea. And how fantastic a sight that must be. We always hear these nature documentaries saying, 
One of the greatest sights in the natural kingdom is the, the commute of the wildebeest, but I think one of the greatest sights in the natural kingdom must be watching a full-sized beech tree fall off a cliff. How lucky are you to see that? In terms of time spent watching, you probably have to wait, wait decades rather than a season that all of those wildlife cameramen complain about, but still, it'd be wonderful to see crash down and become wood to be knocked about and turned into those white bleached tree bones you find on the beach everywhere. There's a little dog trying to come into the orchard. Is he allowed in the orchard? He's got a little nose poking through. He wants to be in here. No, I'm sorry. Taken away again. And I must take myself away as well. Come to the end of the orchard and kitchen garden episode of the garden log. What a place this is, and what a public park. What a resource. The gardening here is done so well, with such care and variety in the way that it's laid out to the public so that I can work out I'm eating the, the AAA apple, and that these are the peaches growing on the wall, and those are the figs in the pots. It's just nice to see a space that recognises that people are interested in all of this stuff around them. The little bench here, I think I would go to sit on, to end the podcast. A little bench in the sun. Oh, look, and there's a bottle of booze lying up there. It's a bottle of, it's a bottle of apple juice from Irma, one of the local supermarkets. How fitting, how poetic. Someone has brought a bottle of apple juice to the orchard to drink and look at the apples. I wonder if it's part of one of those wassailing type rituals. I wonder if they're going to go around and um, feed the trees with the with their blood of their departed fruit. Quite a strange ritual, all told. Oh gosh. I might have to continue the podcast. I just noticed sitting here on the bench, peering over the wall, is a great big hedge of hazel leaves. Which means that that is a nuttery on the other side. And nutteries are some of my very favourite things in the world. When I have space, if I ever have space, I'll have a nuttery, a wonderfully underplanted nuttery, like the one at Sissinghurst, where you get all those great geraniums, or like the ones that I, you see in the black and white pictures of Munstead Wood, Gertrude Jekyll's garden, where she grew all those primulas. I'm just going to come out now through another gate to try and find this, this wood. There's a big big avenue of ornamental crab apples here. They look lovely. They're in their red fruiting stage. Probably something like Everest, something, something fairly normal, but I bet they look good in the spring. We've got to come back here and talk about it again. Right, here we go. Is it a nuttery or is it a hedge? It's a nuttery. There we go. Phew. I thought we were going to find a, a hedge, but no, actually it is a nuttery. And there are well coppiced trees here. Hazel is one of these species that when you coppice it, you extend its life almost indefinitely. I suppose it's the same as summer pruning for those apples. You, you drive off senescence, keep it thinking it's young forever. And these have been coppiced quite some time ago now. And the, the growth that they've thrown out is in places wrist thick, I suppose. But when they were last coppiced, they were as thick as a forearm or a calf. So I suppose we've got quite some time left before they feel the, the sore again. Just squeaking to the end. Of course, there's a lot of them here. I hope the nuts get harvested. There's empty shells on the ground everywhere. I bet the squirrels love it here. Denmark has great, cheeky, long, long-eared red squirrels still, which when you see, you feel almost, how can they be running around in, in everyday life? I thought they were a part of children's cartoons, but actually no, they are the endemic squirrel of Europe and, and a wonderful sight to see. Right, coming to the edge of the woods, oh, there's a ditch. I'm gonna leap over this ditch and there we go. Out onto another lawn with a lovely, field maple above me, seed wings showing pink 
in the light. That's very nice. Lovely pink blush on them. If you hold them up, they look like you know, the bit of the end of a watermelon. When a watermelon's pink flesh meets the green of the rind, and you get that pale green, pale pink ribbon that's very attractive. That's what the wing of this, this Asa so fresh looks like. The ones out in the sun are all dried and ready to fall off. You can hear them there, all crisp. These ones are still lovely. Anyway, sorry, this, oh no. I've just seen a vineyard, I've just seen a vineyard over another hedge. You couldn't make it up. I'll have to come back. We'll do, we'll do a vine special. It's enough, it's enough garden logging for today. I'm going to Italy tomorrow. So there might be, there might be a vine special there. Let's see if I can take the equipment and find any Italian gardens. Until then though, I hope that you have a wonderful time this autumn. I hope that you find places to explore and discover. I'm, I'm going into the vineyard. I can't help myself. Anyway, I'll, I'll do the vines on my own. I hope that you find wonderful places to explore and that nature, whether wild or, or slightly shepherded by human hands, brings you a bit of comfort this season. It's certainly doing a good job on me. So thank you very much for listening and I'll speak to you next time on The Garden Log. Bye bye.